Okay, we are in a um, sermon series uh, in the book of um, 1 Samuel, and uh, today we are looking at 1 Samuel chapter 17, which is the account of um, David and Goliath. Now, it's an extremely long chapter, uh, which means I won't read the whole thing. Uh, I'd encourage you to read it um, at home, but if you have a Bible open in front of you, you'll be able to follow along. We are going to work through the whole chapter uh, fairly quickly, but... Um, right now, we'll just read from verse 31, where this, this kind of gets to the, you know, the climax of the story where David goes out to um, battle uh, Goliath. Uh, it's where, uh, well, where he, from where he volunteers to um, fight Goliath. So let's read it from um, 1 Samuel 17, verse 31. Uh, when the words that David spoke were heard, uh, they repeated them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, that is Goliath, Uh, your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear, And took a lamb from the flock. I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the poor of the lion and from the poor of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armour. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armour, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves not with spear, sorry, with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Okay, we'll stop there. Uh, We'll pray and ask God to um, enable us to understand the passage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this um, story that shows us uh, your power uh, working through weakness. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to see the point of the story, that that we would be able to see what you are teaching us Uh, through this, that our lives would be um, transformed. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this uh, story of um, David and Goliath, it is one of the greatest stories of world literature. 
And it's one that virtually everyone loves because everyone at some point in life has felt like the little guy. You know, the, the little guy standing up against the big bad bully. Uh, that could have happened to you in the schoolyard. It could have happened uh, sometime in the workplace. Uh, this could be uh, standing up over some social injustice. And it's a very popular theme. Many movies are actually based on this very theme. I uh, think of um, Daryl uh, Kerrigan uh, taking on the Melbourne airport in the movie The Castle. Or think of uh, Macaulay Culkin um, many years ago in that movie Home Alone, taking on those big bad uh, robbers. Uh, to some degree, Kung Fu Panda is all based around this, this theme of, of the, 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 the no hoper taking on the forces of evil and overcoming. See, we love watching the oppressed defeat the oppressor. We love watching the powerless defeat the powerful. And because many of us have actually been in the position of the, the powerless, you know, the little guy or the, the, um, the underdog, it means that when we read the account of David and Goliath, we naturally identify with David. And we, we wish we could be David. You now we wish we could defeat uh, those big bad bullies. <clears throat> and so it actually means that when we read this story, we naturally assume that the point of the story is that we are simply to be like David. You know, that, that, that that's what the moral of the story actually is. Uh, so that when we face our own Goliaths in life, that we, you know, if we find the courage like David, that we too will be able to overcome uh, those threats. But as we'll actually see, if we look at the details of this passage, if we pay attention, especially to the, the speeches, there's three big speeches in this passage, when we pay attention to that, we realise that the point of the story isn't try and be like David, but it, there's a much more powerful point to this story, something that if you grasp onto it, it, it actually will change your life. So let's, let's have a look at the story. We'll work through it. We'll go through it quickly, but I'll slow down at the key moments so you can see uh, what the main point is. So if you've got a Bible open, that, that'll be the easiest way to, to follow along. Uh, we're in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, and um, in verse 1 we see that the Philistines are back. Uh, the Philistines, they were the mortal enemies of Israel, and here they are back on Israelite turf uh, trying to start a war. And uh, before any battle actually takes place, there's this big long standoff between the two armies. Uh, you've got this, um, if you can imagine, this huge valley. On one side of the valley are lined up the Philistine army. On the other side is the Israelite army. And it turns out that the Philistines have a new strategy this time. They don't just go out there with swords and start attacking. No, no, this time they have this strategy that involves a really big bloke named Goliath. And Goliath really is enormous. Uh, verse 4 says that his height was six cubits and a span, which if you convert that into metrics, that is actually uh, 2.9 metres. So just for comparison, the tallest NBA player ever, you know, in basketball, was a little bit over 2.3 metres tall. Whereas Goliath, 2.9, so this is another 600 mil uh, taller than the tallest NBA player. And not only is Goliath extremely tall, but he is extremely strong. Uh, he, he's decked out in, a, um, in bronze armour. And just the coat of mail that he wore, which is like you know, little chains uh, of bronze, that alone weighed 57 kilos, just this coat of mail. It says the spear in his, in his hand had a point on it that weighed seven kilos. Can you imagine that hitting a person? <laughs> it would just blow them apart. Uh, you know, Goliath, he, he must have been extremely powerful because fully kitted up, he would have weighed in excess of 250 kilos. If he just sat on you, you would likely die. That's what we're dealing with here. <clears throat> And Goliath, we're told in verse 4, he's called a champion. A champion named Goliath of Gath. Uh, 
So a champion, that's it's a special word in the original language. It actually means a man between. Uh, it means that a man who goes out between the armies and actually fights on behalf of the army. That's what Goliath was, a champion, the man between. In fact, that's the challenge that he issues to Israel uh, in verse 8 where he says, Choose a man for yourself. Let him come down to me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. So this is the idea of the champion. The champion fights on behalf of the army. If they win, that victory is then imputed to the whole army. If they lose, that defeat is then imputed to the whole army. And so that's the challenge. So clearly, what Israel need at this point is a champion, a champion of their own. Who is the champion of Israel? Well, if you've been following uh, the, the sermon series uh, through 1 Samuel, you already know who the champion is supposed to be. It's meant to be Saul, King Saul. And the reason we know that <clears throat> is because right back when, when the Israelites asked for a king, they asked for one who would go out and fight their battles. Right? This is what they need right now, someone to fight their battles. Uh, when Goliath said, choose a man for yourself without realising it, he said the very description that has constantly been used for King Saul. A man you have chosen for yourself. Not only that, King Saul, if you can remember back in chapter 9, verse 2, we were told that he was head and shoulders taller than any other Israelite. So he was a big, tall guy. We even learn later on in this um, chapter that Saul has army, a bronze helmet, just like Goliath, a coat of mail, just like Goliath. And so what's implied is that Saul, he's supposed to be Israel's champion. He's the perfect match for this giant. He could be the one who could go out and fight on behalf of the army. He could be the man between, the one, the, the champion. But what's Saul doing? Uh, look at verse 11. <clears throat> it says, When Saul and all Israel heard the, these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Okay, so Saul, big tall guy, his knees are knocking together as he hears this big Goliath speaking. And uh, why is Saul afraid? Well, from everything we've learned about Saul in the book of 1 Samuel so far, <clears throat> the reason Saul was afraid was because he was an unbeliever. Or should I say he was a believer in himself. Saul believed in himself. Saul was a guy who had a very high opinion of himself. He trusted in his own resources and his own wisdom and his own strength. Unfortunately, though, that doesn't work because when you come up someone who looks bigger than you, then all of a sudden your strength looks like weakness. And so he, he cowers in fear. <clears throat> and it was the same with the whole Israelite army. Not a single man from the Israelite army stepped forward to take on Goliath's challenge. They're all terrified because in their eyes, Goliath looked invincible. It looked absolutely impossible. And this actually reminds us of a key phrase in the last chapter where um, when Samuel was looking for a new king to replace Saul, God said to Samuel, do not look at his height or his, the height of his stature. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And here we see the Israelites are doing the exact opposite. They're judging by appearances. Okay, they're looking at the height and stature of Goliath. That's why they're terrified. Now, while all of that is happening, while everyone's looking at each other pretty helplessly, wondering what on earth are they going to do, verse 12 interrupts the story to introduce to us a young lad named David. And David, he is a young lad. He's the youngest of eight brothers. And uh, the last time we heard about David in uh, this book was uh, where he was playing music for Saul. Uh, in between doing that, David was still looking after his father's sheep out on the farm. 
And uh, on one particular day, uh, David's dad decided to send David with some supplies to where his brothers were, who they were um, part of um, Saul's army. And David's really excited because he gets to go and see where the big boys are fighting. And so he takes the supplies, races off to where they are. But when he gets there, he quickly dumps the supplies off in the supply tent and races to the battle line. And I don't know if he was meant to be there, but as soon as he meets his brothers and says, how are you going? That's when Goliath comes out again. Okay, Goliath did this day after day, issuing this challenge to Israel. And David hears the challenge from Goliath. And David starts talking about the challenge uh, to the soldiers. In fact, we see here that David is actually outraged by Goliath's challenge. He's absolutely outraged by it um, because if you look at verse 26, which, by the way, this is the first time we hear David speaking in the Bible, um, but look what he says in verse 26. David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now notice how differently David sees this, this giant compared to all of Israel. Uh, he doesn't see in terms of appearances. David doesn't look from the perspective of who is the biggest and toughest. No, no, David sees by faith. Okay, David sees from the perspective of the living God. It's the words he uses. And from the perspective of the living God, to David, what does Goliath look like? Just like an overgrown flea. And David has, he has good theology uh, because David sees uh, that the relationship that Israel has to this living God is one that, uh, you know, God is so identified with his people that for Goliath to insult God's people is actually to insult the living God himself. And that was a really big deal for David. Okay, six times in this chapter we're told that Goliath defied the Lord and his people. And David couldn't have that. He couldn't stand that. He was very upset about that. Four times we hear David speaking out about this. You know, how can this guy curse the living God? It really upset David. It's kind of like, um, just so you understand, I don't know if you've ever um, had someone slander your spouse. Or someone slander, you know, you overhear it, someone slandering a really close friend that you love. And doesn't that make you really angry when you hear that? How dare they say that about that person? And the reason we get so upset about it is because uh, it's because we care deeply for the people we love, we care deeply for their honour. And so it really upsets us when someone slanders like that, when someone speaks against uh, the honour of, of someone else. And see, that's how David felt when he heard Goliath slandering the Lord, okay, the living God. Uh, and that's actually what motivated David to do something about it, okay, to actually accept Goliath's challenge. Uh, normally when we read this story, we read that um, David's the only bloke out of all of Israel who had any courage. But that's not actually the point. The point is David is the only one who cared enough about God's honour that he actually took a stand and said, I'm not having that. I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to rebuke that guy. <laughs> That's what motivated David. David was the only one who cared about the glory and honour of the Lord. And it's actually worth pausing there for a minute and just thinking about whether that's something that we've actually grappled with ourselves. Are you someone who cares deeply about God's honour? Are you someone who, who, who understands God's honour and realise that that's a thing? You know, for example, are you someone who, who doesn't hide your faith or doesn't compromise your faith because you actually care deeply about God's honour? Are you someone who, who doesn't put other things ahead of worship of God because 
you care deeply for God's honour. See, that's what it means. Another example is, you know, we, we don't discard the bits of the Bible that, that are unpopular. Why? Because we care about God's honour. This is his word. You don't just throw out bits you don't like. Uh, we, we don't ignore the, the bits of God's word that actually critique us and critique our own behaviour because we care about God's honour. This is God's word. We have no right just to cast it aside. And see, that's the attitude that David had. He cared about God's honour. And so when he heard Goliath dishonouring God, slandering him like he was, it upset him. It motivated him to action. And it's interesting how David's older brother saw that, though. Uh, if you look there in um, verse 28, uh, I don't know if this is older brother syndrome or whether Eliab was um, jealous of David, um, but it says that Eliab, uh, when he heard David speaking like this, his anger was kindled against David and he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know the presumption and the evil of your heart Few have come down to see the battle. And David said, what, what have I now done? Was it not just a better word? See, Eliab, he's actually looking at um, David just like Saul and just like all the Israelites, judging by appearances. And in Eliab, as the older brother, he looks at David and, and what does he see? Here's David volunteering to fight Goliath. He doesn't see a man standing up for God's honour. No, no, he sees a cocky runt. You know, what a smart aleck. And so he actually gets angry at David and criticises him. It's because he couldn't see what David could see. He couldn't see that the issue at stake was God's honour. Well, David doesn't let his brother's um, criticism deter him. And he keeps talking about fighting Goliath. And that word gets to King Saul. And so Saul invites David to come and talk to him. Uh, and, and then we have in verse 32, uh, it's actually a really pathetic picture because you've got little David saying to big tall Saul, in verse 32, he says, uh, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. But like Eliab, Saul criticises David. He says, you're too young, you're, um, you're too inexperienced. See, Saul's judging by appearances. Uh, he says, Goliath's been a champion, like a heavyweight champion forever. Uh, but then notice what David says, very telling. Okay, it's, it's David's speeches so that are the key to understanding this passage. Uh, David starts talking about how he killed lions and bears in the past. And the reason he talks about that is not to try to prove to Saul that he's a really great fighter. The reason he says it is because he's saying that every time he's fought a lion and a bear in the past, God has always looked after him. And he's saying, I'm confident that God will do that in this case with Goliath. So you look at verse 37 that sort of sums it up. David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And so what does Saul do with that? He says, okay, no worries. The Lord be with you. Go and do it. And then what does Saul do? Does Saul call a prayer meeting? You know, does he get down on his hands and knees and pray for David that the Lord would deliver him? Well, no, no. He, he actually takes out his own armour and tries to put it on David. And, um, you know, it's obviously too big. David says he hasn't tested them, he can't use them, and so he chucks them off. Uh, he takes his um, stick and a sling and a few stones. And uh, the reason Saul still, he's, you know, still, Saul's still thinking in terms of human strength. You know, he's still thinking in terms of what he sees. And uh, that's why he wants to put the armour on David. But David has something better than armour. <laughs> Then comes the event. <laughs> We're getting there. Verse uh, 40, end of verse 40. This is where David enters, enters the battlefield. If this was a movie, this would be where the dramatic music starts. And the big, you know, the pan scenes. And then we get to see from Goliath's perspective, looking at this, this little guy walking towards him. And Goliath, he is offended. 
Goliath is insulted that Israel would send this little runt to fight him. Surely he's worthy of, of something better than that. And so Goliath, he disdains David and he says to David, do you see those birds over there? You're going to be their dinner. And then David makes a speech, which is one of the greatest speeches in the Bible. It tells us the meaning of the story. So verse 45, if you look at that, uh, it says that David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So you notice how David interprets the picture. Right? Goliath thinks this is big guy versus little guy. Goliath thinks this is sword and spear versus sticks and stones. But David, he doesn't see it like that. David sees this as sword and spear against the God of Israel, the living God. David comes in the name of the Lord, or that is on behalf of the Lord, to fight Goliath who has challenged the God of Israel. And uh, David says to Goliath, you have made a very big mistake by challenging God. And he goes on about, you know, birds and beasts eating stuff. Uh, but then verse 47, uh, David says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give it into our hand. So notice how David repeats that it's not with sword and spear that the Lord saves. And that's the key to understanding this, this story. It's not with sword and spear. In other words, it's not by human strength that God saves his people. It's not by normal human abilities. You know, it's not like if we could just get enough people together, if we could just get our act together, that then we can do great things. That's not how God works. The point is that God saves, but he saves by weakness. He saves by providing a champion who comes in weakness and humility. That's the point of the story. And have a look at the way this story finishes. The battle takes place. It's all over at the start of round one. Just one stone and that's it. It's all over. The stone hits Goliath in a part of his uh, head that, where the helmet mustn't have quite covered and it sinks into his forehead. He falls down fat, <laughs> flat on his face with an almighty thud. David races over to him, borrows Goliath's sword without asking, cuts off Goliath's head. And when the Philistines see that, they all panic and start running for their lives. The Israelites all get up and chase them away and then go and plunder their camp. Now we started this story, remember, by talking about the need for a champion. Israel needed a champion. They needed a man between, someone to go out before them and fight on their behalf. And what kind of champion did they need? Not the type that the world would provide. The champion they needed was one whose heart was bound up with God's honour, someone who didn't judge by what he saw, but could see into the true nature of things. We need a champion who, even though he was despised and doubted and rejected, still puts his life on the line to rescue a people who clearly don't deserve it. Do you see what this story is about? It's about a champion. It's about the champion that we need. The one who defeats what threatens his people and whose victory is then imputed to his people, the ones he fights for. That's the point of the story. The, the moral of this story is not try to be like David, you know, try to pluck up the courage and you too can go out and fight your Goliaths. That's not what the story is saying. The story is saying that we need a champion like David. We need a champion because we face problems far greater than our own little personal Goliaths. I mean, we face the problems of evil in the world. 
we face the problem of sin in our hearts. We face the problem of the fact that every single one of us in this room has, at the end of your life, this thing called death. And you can't escape that. And even worse than that, every one of us will face judgment after death. Now, in the light of those problems, those enemies, it doesn't matter how much courage you try to muster up in your life. You are powerless before these things. And so what all of us need, all of us actually need a champion. Can you imagine if there actually was a champion who could go out and defeat these kinds of things? Someone who could defeat all of the evil in the world. Someone who could defeat sin. Who could actually defeat death. And when he wins the victory over these things, shares that victory with you so that you're, you can overcome these kind of things. Can you imagine if there was a champion like that? And what the Bible tells us is that there is, there is such a champion. His name is not David. His name is Jesus. See, Jesus, he is the true and better David. He's the one who has actually taken on the enemies of sin, death and evil. And he did it not at the risk of his life, he did it at the cost of his life. See, that's the point of the Bible. The point of the Bible is that Jesus actually went to the cross and he won the victory over death. He won the victory over sin and evil. Uh, about Jesus in Colossians 2.15, it says that Jesus, having disarmed the powers and authorities, that's talking about sin, evil and death, it says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And so the story of David and Goliath, it's not us becoming like David. If there's anyone we should be like in the story, it's those Israelite soldiers at the end who get to share in the victory of the true, true champion. And do you realise you can do that today? By putting your trust in Jesus. By having him as your champion. Becoming his follower. See, this story, it's actually a call to make sure that you're on the right team. That you're on the team of the true champion. Because if you are, if you are following Jesus, that means you cannot lose. Okay? Even as you face death at the end of your life, you can't lose because Jesus has already won the victory at the cross and he proved it by rising from the dead. Which means that if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're on his team and if he is your champion, then you too will live forever with him. Uh, earlier in the service we read from Romans 8 and Romans 8 is basically saying the same thing as the David and Goliath story that because Jesus has triumphed over sin and death, that everyone who trusts in him shares in that victory. And that's why Romans 8, and I'm glad um, Andrew did read the rest of the chapter, <laughs> uh, because it goes on to say that if we are one with Christ, if we belong to him, we can't lose. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, Jesus, he's the champion. He's the champion you need. And that if you have him, you have the eternal victory. Amen. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful Saviour Jesus is. We praise you that he was not concerned about wealth and honour and, and, and pleasure and power that, that this world has to offer, but he, that he was passionate uh, for his Father's glory. And we praise you, Father, that he, when he came into this world, that he was a humble servant, that he was willing to put his life on the line and even to give it in order to save his people. We praise you that he has triumphed over sin and death and over evil, that he has risen victorious and that one day he's going to come again as the victorious king. 
and remove evil from this world forever. And we thank you that by trusting in him that we won't be removed with that evil, but rather will reign, uh, reign with him forever. Father, we pray that this um, story, that it would in encourage us and comfort us as we face all of the troubles in our lives and as we think about the end of our lives, we pray that Christ would be our hope, uh, that he would be our joy and that he would be our confidence of that eternal victory. We pray it in his name. Amen.